When the full moon rises, everyone knows to be on high alert. The full moon has long been cause for the strange shifts in human behavior, but is perhaps most associated with the transformation of one exceptionally fearful being, the werewolf. One of the most common themes of werewolves is their craving for human flesh. At night, these creatures are said to hunt for victims in order to sate their deep hunger. Jack Owen Spillman III was known as the werewolf butcher because he stalked hunted his victims, and then mutilated and tore their flesh just as a werewolf would. Hello, my name is Holly. Come join me in the Murder She Shed for Halloween Month to discuss this serial killer that truly believed he was a werewolf. Before you leave, just make sure you smash that subscribe button to hear all my rarely told true crime cases, usually inside that she shed back there. But since it's Halloween, I decided to do it in front of the campfire so I can look all orange and scary because apparently this makes lighting makes me look orange. Anyway, if you want to see the, more of this crazy chick, just hit the subscribe button. Come back and visit me here anytime. You're welcome inside my she shed. Well, except for I'm sleeping. Don't creep up and stalk me. My husband out here again. Last time my husband was out here. Just Max. Let me add on this one that this one's kind of a gruesome Halloween true crime case. So you might not want to hear it. Viewer discretion is advised. And if you don't want to hear something kind of gruesome, then go check out Murder She Shit and uh, look at another video that you might be interested in. Jack Owen Spillman was born August 30th, 1969 in Spokane, Washington. His mother had four husbands and four children. Sadly, none of them knew who their actual father was. One of these stepfathers changed Jack's name. He was actually formerly known as Roy. It is thought that Jack was possibly essayed as a young child. Jack was the only boy in his family surrounded by sisters. The family grew up on a farm. Jack was a quiet child whose favorite activity was to sit and rock. He could rock for hours. He was a loner who seemed to always zone out when he was around people. Jack's sister had pet rabbits, but one day he walked up to his sister carrying one of her rabbits. Only it was dead, and he had a smirk on his face. His sister could tell the way Jack acted that he had, you know, disposed of her rabbit. But he denied it, and his mother said, he told you he didn't do it, just bury the darn thing. Or she said something like that. And so the sister said, okay, he didn't do it. And they could have stopped his bad behavior, maybe right there, or at least a little bit. But mother wouldn't accept that he had killed the rabbit. So leave it to mothers to make their kids always serial killers. Why is it always the mother's fault? Jack liked to expose himself to the ladies, exposing himself to several of their neighbors, even once exposing himself at the public library. Jeez, can you imagine these old lady librarians getting exposed to that? I mean, they act all innocent. They may not be. You're probably a librarian out there. I apologize, but you may be wilder than I think you are. You naughty, naughty librarian. You may be just hiding behind that. I'm sidetracked. But Jack, he showed them his stuff. I doubt if they were that impressed, but he did it anyway. Jack started drinking alcohol at 10 years old. It was known to be cruel to animals. One day, Jack was petting a neighbor's cat when he got an urge to kill it with his bare hands. Jack was not a high achiever. He dropped out of school in ninth grade. His IQ was 87, which put Jack at a low average intelligence. Prior to the murders, Jack had run-ins with the police. Burglary, theft, assault, his crime list was extensive. As an adult, Jack remained in Spokane, lived in a trailer, and worked as a butcher. He thought the solitary work suited him and helped him with his fantasies of dismembering meat and abnormal obsession with blood. Hence the name, the Werewolf Butcher. I'm sure you already figured that out, but I had to say it. That's my job. In 1993, Jack and a friend were arrested on SA allegations after their victim escaped and named them as the men who had attacked her. The crime allegedly occurred after the three had met at a bar in King County. The woman accepted a lift home with the two men and later described to the police how Jack had held her down while his 26-year-old roommate had essayed her. 
Before Jack could do the same, however, she actually was able to escape and report the attack. After this attack, he was sent to Washington State Prison in Walla Walla, where he discussed his innermost fantasies with his cellmate. He told his cellmate that he wanted to become the world's greatest serial killer and discussed his sick, depraved fantasies. He read extensively about serial killers and police forensics and books he collected, explaining that when he killed, he would take specific precautions against leaving behind any incriminating evidence. He would do this by studying other killers and their crimes and analyzing how they were caught and the mistakes they made that led to their discovery. He talked about shaving off all his body hair and wearing ninja-like clothing. To avoid DNA, he said that he would tape around his socks and shoes and wear glubber, glubber gloves, glubber gloves, rubber gloves and tape them to his sleeves. He said he would remove as much material as possible from the crime scene and then burn it. He said he would knock his victim out with a baseball bat and then bring them to another location so that he could torture and mutilate them. He said his ultimate fantasy was to be essayed by a large male while he was torturing and mutilating young girls. <laughs> yeah, that's a creepy guy. He told the other prisoners how he wanted to cut off young girls' private parts and shove beer bottles and other items in the girls. He also mentioned what he believed to be an affinity with werewolves, claiming that he often thought of himself as one carefully selecting and hunting down his victims over time. I don't know this concept of the wolf. Like I said, it's almost like a thing inside of me. It's like a wolf that's born the hunger. He often imagined torturing young girls in a cave, keeping them for weeks in order to torture them and cut out their hearts before consuming them. While in prison, he cut his arm with a razor blade and sucked the blood out of the womb. He was given stitches, although I don't think he should have been given stitches. I think the sucker should have been left to bled out. Then he wouldn't have killed anybody. Yeah, that's not nice of me. Yeah, it is. It's completely nice of me. After being released from prison, Jack started collecting wolf figurines and wolf posters and had them all over his house. He said wolves were loners like him who liked to observe people from a distance. One day he was doing exactly that when he heard his 18-year-old niece tell her mom that she had been in a fight with another girl at school. A couple of nights later, a cop appeared at the niece's door and asked her if she had been the one to break into this girl's house, rob it, and kill the girl's pet hamster. The hamster's head was cut off, and blood was spread throughout her room. The knife he had used to kill the hamster was stuck into the girl's stuffed animal. The niece had an alibi, and it wouldn't be known for years later that it had been Jack that had been the perpetrator. Jack loved to sneak into houses even when people were home especially probably. He would get a thrill from the excitement of stalking people. Jack's girlfriend, who he did not live with, said that she woke up one full moon night to Jack standing above her, staring at her, and he seemed zoned out. When she flicked on the lamp, he instantly came to be Jack again. She asked him what he was doing here, and Jack said he let himself in because he had missed her. Penny Lynn Davis was born on May 26, 1985 in Tacoma, Washington. She had two brothers and one sister. In 1994, when Penny was nine years old, Jack's girlfriend was living with Penny's parents when Penny went missing while walking near a creek. Jack occasionally stayed with the Davis family, too. The Davis family lived in a simple home with no running water and no power except from a generator. There was also no telephone, so Penny's mother had to actually drive 16 miles into town to report her daughter missing. The 33-year-old single mother of four had been searching the area around her home by horseback for several hours after her seven-year-old son, who had been playing outside with Penny, reported that she had walked off and had never come back to play with him. The authorities originally thought Penny was lost, and then they spent hours searching the area. Later, as hours turned into days, they thought she might have actually run away, or that relatives might have kidnapped her. P. 
Penny's grandmother in Texas had kidnapped two of her other grandchildren from their home in Massachusetts two weeks before Penny actually disappeared. Detectives flew to Texas to make sure Penny was not there. But one suspect did stand out right away when the deputies first drove up to the Davis residence. They saw a man driving along Patterson Creek Road, which was the road to the Davis home. He gave his name as Jack Spielman and said he was helping Penny's mother search for Penny. Deputies did not talk to Jack for long at that time, but they later interviewed him about 1 a.m. the following morning. By that time, deputies had learned that Jack, a known offender, had been close to the Davis family. Jack would help with searches every time they looked for Penny, and he denied any involvement in her disappearance. Jack's sister also said every time anything about Penny was on TV, that he actually recorded it and creepily watched it again and again. Jack told his sister it's because he thought it would give him a hint about where Penny could be found. She believed Jack because she just figured he cared for the little girl since he was familiar with her. Her body wouldn't be found until March 28, 1995. The body was discovered after hikers told authorities that they had found a piece of human jawbone in an area of mixed woods and sagebrush. The rest of her remains were then found in a shallow grave in McLaughlin Canyon, less than 13 miles from the Davis home. Authorities identified Penny by matching her DNA to her mother's. Tests on insects found on the body would indicate that Penny was buried elsewhere after the murder, then was moved and reburied in McLaughlin Canyon. The original burial site was never found. They would not find out who murdered her until the following month when Jack was caught for two more gruesome murders. After Penny's body was found, Jack moved to Wenatchee, Washington. While living there, he was suspected of peeping into windows and watching young girls. Surprise, surprise. At one of the homes where he worked as a roofer, the family found their cat dead and mutilated on the front room floor. In February 1995, a woman is approached by Jack, whom she would later identify by a photograph in the newspaper. She told detectives that he stopped to talk with her as she weeded her front yard, asking her if she was married and where she worked, just a creepo. Shortly after that, she began receiving obscene phone calls. Rita Huffman was a 48-year-old divorced woman from East Wenatchee, Washington, who worked as a car salesman. Rita had a 14-year-old daughter named Mandy Huffman, an older daughter who actually no longer lived at home. Jack became obsessed with Mandy after seeing her at a softball practice. He often hung out at the baseball fields to watch young girls. When Rita picked Mandy up from the field, he followed them home. For months, he stalked Rita and Mandy. Rita had a personal encounter with Jack at the Igloo Tavern on April 10th while visiting with friends and co-workers in the tavern. When she walked to a phone inside the tavern to take a call from her daughter, on the way back, a man sitting at the bar grabbed her arm. They exchanged words briefly, and she walked back to her friends. Tavern workers and friends and co-workers later identified Jack as the man at the bar. No one reported knowing what the verbal exchange was about. Jack, they said, left shortly after that without finishing the only beer that he had ordered. On April 12, 1995, it seemed like a normal night in the 600 block of North Jerome Street. But by morning, a woman would find her mother and sister slaughtered in their own home. When her mom, Rita, or sister Mandy wouldn't answer the phone the next morning, she decided to drive to the house. The front door was locked, so she went around to a sliding rear door that was always unlocked. If you don't pick up anything from what I'm telling you tonight, lock your doors. Lock your doors. I don't care where you live. If you think you're in a safe community, you're probably not. Just lock your stinking doors. Inside the home, she found their bodies. One was in a bedroom and one in the family room, both smeared in a great deal of blood. She ran screaming to a neighbor who called for help. The responding police officers observed that the victims of this gruesome double homicide had been mutilated in a variety of ways by someone who seemed more animal than human. Investigators looked inside and around the house for evidence. After entering the home, authorities found Rita's body lying on a couch in the family room. 
She had been stabbed 31 times and viciously mutilated. Her body removed and placed near Amanda's body. She was naked except for a nightgown, which the killer had pulled back to expose the body, and there was evidence that the killer had undressed her. Rita had been cut from the private area to mid-chest, which exposed some internal organs. Her private area was excised and stuffed into her mouth, and in a final indignity, her body was posed for exposure. They walked down the dark hallway to the master bedroom, where they found Mandy's new body in her mother's bed. On Mandy's wrist, a stopped watch indicated that a struggle had occurred around 1135. She had been stabbed and bludgeoned in the head, Then, after which the killer had shoved a baseball bat into her privates. He had also cut her, placing skin from her privates onto her face. The mother's privates had been placed on a dresser and headboard beside her daughter's body. An examination of the bodies later at the morgue near the time of death for both to between 11 and 3 a.m. The chief deputy was advised that a patrol officer had stopped a person named Jack Owen Spielman III at 2 a.m. on suspicion of burglary. Jack was in a dark colored Chevy pickup truck with large tires and a row bar. He had parked near a trash receptacle in the parking lot of a VFW hall which was closed for the night. This VFW hall was in the vicinity of the crime scene. When the officers had approached Jack, the suspect raised his hands in the position of surrender. If they don't say guilty, I don't know what does. The officer thought that the suspect, who was dressed in black, was a burglar. 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 I can't say it. He stole things. Okay? He stole things. Finding no sign of a break-in, Jack was properly identified and released. Investigators were dispatched to the VFW hall where the patrol officer had confronted Jack that night. The detectives subsequently located what was eventually determined to be one of the murder weapons lodged in the bottom of the trash can near where Jack had been parked. A 12-inch knife covered in blood was recovered and it appeared to match a knife set in the victim's house. They also found a witness who had seen the truck near the crime scene at 1130. Although Jack had been released from custody since they had nothing on him, they watched him while they looked into his background. While under surveillance, Jack tossed out an item that, when retrieved, turned out to be a blood-soaked ski mask. The blood was Mandy's. There was a blood stain near an opening in the mask. It was later learned that he had drank Mandy's blood. But are we even surprised by now? Probably not. At 11.30 a.m. on April 12th, a teenager driving his girlfriend home in the Huffman neighborhood saw a big Chevy truck, gray in color, with big tires and a short box parked about 250 feet from the rear of the Huffman's residence. Its driver, authorities discovered, would have had a good view of the unlocked back sliding glass door of the Huffman house. There also have been reports of seeing this same truck at the softball field on several occasions. This man who thought he was so good at getting rid of any DNA from crime scene had placed his bloody clothes and bloody gloves on the front seat of his truck. They also found hair and fibers at the crime scene that belonged to Jack. Blood found on the recovered knife matched both victims. After arrested, Jack was quick to confess to the murder of nine-year-old Penny Davis. He told authorities that he actually had his sights set on her 12-year-old older sister. But Penny happened to be the one he found alone that day. After finding Penny near the creek, he picked her up and carried her on his shoulders so she would leave no footprints behind. He then carried her deep in the woods and tied her to a tree. He then cut on her while she was still alive and screaming. After toying with her for a couple hours, he then plunged the knife deep into her stomach. He placed her body in some nearby water, but it just kept floating back up. So he dug a shallow grave, placed her body in it, and replaced the dirt back over her. He returned to this site multiple times and dug her up in order to essay her corpse. He's done everything else. At this point, we're not even surprised, I'm sure. When her body was found, it was placed in the same position as Rita and Mandy had been posed. All the victims had their legs wide apart in order to demean them after their death. 
He was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole in April 1996 for the first-degree aggravated murder of Rita, 70 years for the murder of her daughter, Amanda, and 45 and a half years for the murder of Penny Davis. He remains behind bars at the Washington State Penitentiary in Walla Walla, Washington. In the end, this werewolf wasn't as invisible as he had thought. The werewolf butcher will never be free again to lurk about during the full moon, finding those weaker than him to destroy. He is locked in a pen forever where he will die and never be able to see the full moon again. Well, that was the werewolf butcher. Glad you could join me for Halloween at my campfire that is finally warm again because I put more wood in it. And now I'm going to bed, so now I'm going to have to try to put it out. Maybe Simon will come pee on it. There he is, speaking to Simon. <laughs> you ready to pee on the fire and put it out? We need to go in for them wolves get us tonight, Bubba, huh? Tell them good night. Say we love you. Look that way, not this way. <laughs> Say no, I'm just going to hug Mama. I like to hug Mama. Hugging Mama is my favorite thing to do in the world. You got lipstick all over you now, Bubba. Sate, they're deep hunger. Is that how you say it? Sate. Saturate. Satate. Sate. S-A-T-E? Is that right? I don't even know. I'm just going to go with it. It's going to get darker the longer I'm out of here. So I'm going to get oranger the longer we're out here. I'm going to end up looking like Trump in a minute. Is there craving for human flesh? <laughs> Believed he was a werewolf. Just like I believe I'm a vampire in my past life. I'm just joking. I'm not that crazy. I do have some things though outside my she shed in front of the campfire so you can enjoy the ambiance. Is that a word? Ambiance of fall. Isn't that like the mood? The the setting of fall. It puts you in the mood. Ambiance, right? Maybe I'm making this word up. I'm not sure. Anyway, just hit the subscribe button. You get to hear this crazy chicks I'm with the two men. And later, I'm sorry, motorcycles just want to go by tonight. I think it's that kid that speeds through down the road. Listen, kid, if you watch me on here, it's one of my neighbors over here. You need to quit speeding that motorcycle. You're going to kill yourself. Like, you go 100 miles per hour, and there's dogs, there's cows out. We live out in the country, dude. Slow your bike down. I never drive mine that fast out here. That's just... I thought you went inside with your daddy. Apparently you didn't. Off young girl's private part. Hear those coyotes? Woohoo, the werewolf's out tonight. I need uh, more fire on my. Another log. Of course. In McLaughlin Canyon. Why are you taking. <laughs> Max is carrying this huge stick, sliding in all the way across the yard. Anyway, you gonna tell him bye? Tell him you'll see him in the daytime at the barter she has.